What's up, everybody? This is another episode of The Sea Life. My name is Tyler Mounts, and I am here with my guest today, who is Dr. Robert Bray. Dr. Robert Bray is the founder of DISC, uh, and he's going to tell us not only what that stands for, but what they do as a company. So first of all, Dr. Bray, good to have you today. Thank you. I'm glad to be here and uh, excited about this to tell the story. Yeah, I'm excited to hear it. It's uh, uh, it's something that's interesting and, and innovative and disruptive, and those are all fun stories to hear, uh, especially when you understand the vision behind it. So we'll get into that story part of it, but before we do, can you just tell us what DISC is? Uh, DISC is a multidisciplinary medical group. It involves surgeons and pain management. It's designed to give medical care in, in a unique and different way, medical and surgical care. We created a, a center to do outpatient high acuity. And when you think of a surgery center, you think of something you go to to have a hernia or get a colonoscopy. DISC is a full spectrum of spinal care. We do surgeries through the front of the neck, through the belly, through the back, high acuity cases in an outpatient environment that you would have thought would have been hospital cases for many years. Yes, I mean, so you have to forgive my my uh, naivety in this, but like, how do you go in for a spine surgery and then leave? Like, uh, isn't that, aren't you like laid up and need to be in the hospital for days after that? And that's the disruptive nature of it. We, we've created the whole recipe, so to speak, the, the processes we call them, the know-how to take that patient and turn it into, you come in for your spine surgery, you have it, and by dinner, you're home. Up and, and mobile and around and back to work in a few days. So it's creating that whole field of minimally invasive surgery and how to apply it and, and putting it into practice. And it's been a 20-year growth curve to do it. Wow, fascinating. Okay, so before we uh, dig too deep into what you guys do, I want to I get an idea of your background. So Dr. Bray, my understanding is you got your start in medicine uh, through the Air Force. Is that right? When it, when it came time to go to medical school, uh, I actually graduated UCSD in California, started Colgate, New York. Came time to go to medical school, and it, it was $60,000. It might have been $6 million. I didn't have it. <laughs> I, I, well, how did, so you did pre-med undergrad? I did pre-med undergrad, started at Colgate, played hockey there, finished at UCSD, and then um, got accepted to Baylor in Houston. Very expensive place, great school, no way to pay for it. So I, uh, I so, did. Was there any thought that went into this? Like when you selected pre med, were you aware that you weren't going to be able to pay for med school? Uh, it, it's one of those things that I can't really tell you where I started. I always said I want to be a doctor. I spent years as a, in college working in steel mills to get money to go to school. So oh no, I didn't. Really, I didn't really think it out. Uh, but I finally got there and, and got in, and. Uh, the Air Force was kind enough to offer me a scholarship at that time called HPSP, and they picked up all my bills and put me through school and residency. So I moved to Houston and spent the next 10 years there. So, and that's that's the way it works. So you're like, I want to be a doctor, don't know how to do that, and the Air Force became a means to doing that. What, what kind of medicine were you anticipating studying? Did you always know you wanted to be a surgeon? Uh, I always... Two things. One, I always liked working my hands. I was a machinist at the time, doing things. And two, I uh, I really was a doer. I wanted to get in and do things. So surgery was a natural fit for me. Uh, you don't really decide ahead of time. You get in and you do rotations on cardiology and pediatrics and all these things. And uh, neurosurgery kind of fell in my lap. Huh. And so this, you just knew you wanted to be a doctor. And you didn't know how or, or what exactly you were going to do. But you kind of just took things as they came? Um, a bit a bit like that, yes. You you get in, and um, I don't think anybody knows going into surgery these days, if you talk to anybody going in, what it really means or what it is. And uh -huh. it, it's a matter of elevating your game each time. You, you think you've got it tough in college, and then you go to medical school, and they dump a bunch of stuff on you. You, you don't realize really until you get to residency what, what it means. And I'll, I'll give you the example. Um, try staying up for 36 hours and working straight. Huh. Okay, go, go get 12 hours off and then go back and do it again. And just do that for three or four days and, and see how you feel after three or four days. Literally working 36 hours nonstop and then going back. I had five and a half years of that. 
with wow. with no days off. Crazy. Not, not a not a week off, not a weekend. Anything. You you kind of knew what you were doing. If you were awake, you were working. And you know exposure in the trauma hospitals and the community hospitals and taking bullets out in the middle of the night. Um, it's a big push and a big commitment. But you do kind of just each step you get to, you you realize this is my next step. And if you want to do it, you buckle down, put one foot in front of the other, and you do it. And it, it develops a, a sort of a whole personality and a class of people that, that get through it. What was your your mindset like at this stage? Were you just – was it co- happening too fast that you just were trying to keep up? Were you, were you drinking it up? Like did you love it? Well, my wife now calls my uh, surgery my crack. That I, I I go to the operating room for my crack. It's my it's my my zen and my focus. I can go and and do a surgery, and it doesn't matter if it's two hours or ten hours. It it's five minutes to me. It wow. it, it just absorbs you, and it's in, in completeness. Um, Are you? Is that a, I mean, uh, is that something unique to you, or is that all surgeons? Uh, it it's most surgeons at the top of their game are huh. are really they are are very into what they're doing, and huh. it's it's. Uh, um, it absorbs them. Wow. So it's, um, I, I think as we went along and, and went through, uh, it, it, a lot of times it was one foot in front of the other up at 4.30 the next day after you'd been up, you know, the all night and 36 hours a day before. And, and um, you, you just moved with it and grew with it. And it, it shaped you yeah. and, and developed you. So How long did you step. say that lasted? Um, residency was six years. Six years. And then I'm assuming after that you have to serve in the Air Force for a period of time, right? Because they want to get their money's worth. <laughs> they they're, uh, they want to get their piece back, yes. Um, I went on active duty after completing neurosurgical training at Baylor. And I was uh, fortunate enough to get stationed up in Northern California, nice okay. location, yeah. at Travis Air Force Base. And I became the chief of neurosurgery there and for 14 states in the West Coast and over all of overseas. And the Air Force has a lot of airplanes, so they uh, flew all the patients into us. And it was a, a, a unique opportunity because instead of getting out and being in a junior partnership somewhere on the bottom of a heap, uh, I got out and had a giant hospital with a giant practice and referrals from everywhere right off the bat with wow. a lot of responsibility instantly. So it was a ton of fun. It was a great development piece. And it really gave me a chance to practice without the burden of all of everything else that's going on with medicine. So, yeah. uh, you, you know, come in and do what you need to do that's right for the patient. Yeah. It was a great place to start, and um, I, I would actually call the, the military, therefore, my mentor and, and how I grew with it, where, huh. where it got going, formed my bases. And so, obviously, you're not dealing with the mess of, you know, the in insurance world and you know private practice and hospitals and all of those different dynamics and you just kind of get to do uh hone your craft really right and that was a great part about it and and really one of the pieces missing in medical school they they uh, didn't have any business classes and when you get out in the real world after i got off active duty although i stayed for a lot of years reserve um yeah it, running a business was a whole different venture and Medicine has changed so much in the last 20 years and how the business of it is administered. And that's really been the challenge to keep up and develop what I wanted to do and make it merge into the business of where medicine was going. Yeah, so you get, so active, you're active duty for how long? Um, just over four years. And then you, was it always the plan to do four years and then get out? Um, I actually thought it was going to stay and, and, um, and uh, stay on either an active or active reserve time and then... I got a call and an offer from a hospital in developing in Los Angeles one day, and and um, my wife at the time said I'd rather uh, move there, and it's where my family was from, and I had four kids, and picked up and moved to L.A. So wow. I stayed on reserves, but came off active and started a private practice. And so you had decided, okay, we're going to go, wait, so you, the private practice was within the hospital? Uh, I, I started with a small hospital that was uh, Century City in Los Angeles, but very shortly after I was here, I developed and moved my practice to Cedar sinai Medical Center, which was okay. a large medical center in West L.A., obviously. Yeah, so you go from this gig at the Air Force where it's just like probably constant, like all the time, things happening, and then now you're like, I've got a balance my accounts payables and my accounts receivables and I've got to do – and so the, uh, obviously would have been a pretty radical shift for you. How did how did you do with that? Uh, 
uh, not not real well the first year out. I <laughs> I, uh, I saved my first year tax return, and I I still have it. Uh, the end of uh, the first full year, I made one dollar. What one dollar? One dollar after I paid the expenses, setting up the office, employing people, getting it set up, getting it going. I I made a buck. Um, oh my gosh! So I, uh, it, it was a it was a trial to get it out and get going, and it, it's hard for people these days. Even now, it's hard, and that's where medicine changed so much over the 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 years as it's gone on. Um, when I got out, there was still private practice and people in individual practices, and that's kind of melted away. And the the individual doctor has has uh, not really survived very well. Huh. So things changed, and people became employed by hospitals and they took up the realm of wanting to employ people and so doctors became employees to a large fact or into uh, 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 positions of academia where they could teach and have an employment salary and private practice really went down and because of a lot of the complexities of dealing with insurances and how to and but in the recent years new projects where I'm going now, that's really changed. And now it's coming back. But you have to be a part of a structure or a group. You have to have some power. Hmm. Uh, and the individual practitioner has been very tough. It really hasn't survived very well. So you started this private practice at, down at Cedar sinai um, And first year is a little rough. Second year is a little better, I'm assuming. Well, I started with a small hospital, Century City, and then I moved to Cedars. And, and oh. At Cedars formed the uh, the first multidisciplinary spine group, and that was a big shift in my career. I, I was trained as a uh, pediatric brain surgeon and, and doing uh, adult vascular tumors. And when I got out of the Air Force, I said, you know, I'm going to do one thing and try to do it well, and I chose spine. Mm -hmm. um, didn't actually go down well with me with pediatrics. I didn't like seeing little kids with brain tumors. It, mm -hmm. it took, a lot of, took a lot out of your soul. Yeah. So I, I went into spine, and I became the first neurosurgeon actually in the U.S. to do 100% spine in my practice. Really? And I— Sorry, wh wh what year was this? Uh, 1990. 1990, um, okay. About so, 30 years into practice. So at this point, the the hyper-specialization like that wasn't something that existed, or at least not in, in spine? So there really weren't even fellowships, and spine was really just coming into its own to be its own piece. And huh. So I started, and— dedicated my whole practice to actually went to the boards and neurosurgeons and said, I'm going to do just this and not brain anymore and uh, got their support and then started the f first truly multidisciplinary spine program. Uh, it's called the West Coast Spine Institute way back when. And we had orthopedic and neurosurgery and chiropractic and trainers and it really tried to think across the board how spine was going to be done. Um, very disruptive to what was going on at the time. Yeah, I mean, that sounds disruptive now, and I can only imagine in the 90s. Um, so what, what, was the, what was the catalyst for that? So you, you're, you've decided, I want to only do spine. I want to be the best I possi possibly can be at this one, this one type of surgery. And then you decide that in order to, I mean, what was the process to create that? I, I had a concept in mind at the time. And, and uh, of course, uh, my young impulsive thing. I thought that'd take a few years to put in place and it's taken me 20 years to grow the concept <laughs> yeah, instead, yeah, yeah. but we got there. So we're, we're doing quite well. Um, I was trained by some really smart people. Robert Grossman was the head of the program at Baylor. He's still around as the, the head of the uh, emeritus of the program. Brilliant guy. And he started me using a microscope. And it, it was interesting. I was on this rotation and we used to work, use eyeglasses with little magnifiers in them to work. And he took your loops and locked them in his drawer and said, you're going to do everything through the microscope. And when I wasn't working, he told me to go into the lab and may sound a bit odd, but cut the leg off a rat and then sew it back on and get it to live. What? So when I was not working in the ER or anyplace else, I was sewing rat legs back on. Oh my um, gosh. <laughs> it taught us to work in a different environment, which was under magnification. Now, none of the tools or instruments fit. Nothing worked right. It was a very crude scope. And he just said, when you get done, go redesign the whole thing. It, it's is where it's going. And he was visionary enough to see that's where things were going. So I got the chance very early to start and worked under a microscope when no one else really had huh. uh, doing things. And I wanted to take that and apply it to spine. And it really hadn't been done. So that was where uh, the main step of coming out, saying I'm going to choose something and do it well. 
I'm going to start microscope creation in spinal surgery, and that's going to change how we think about things. So if you are deciding, so are you seeing the decline of private practice happening, and that's why you went this multiple, like what was the, why not just be the best you know, microscopic spine surgeon in the country and have people come to you for that one thing. Like why build this concept around it in, in you know, at least at this point in your, in your practice or your career? Well, that gets out a whole bigger statement of what, what I'm doing now, what I've learned over this whole period of time. And, um, it was about getting it bigger than just me being a microsurgeon and doing it. So I've done 14,000 cases now. So i Usually people retire about five or six, so I've got quite a, quite a load under the belt on how to learn how to do it. But it was taking this concept and not only what you could do with it, but how you could teach people to do it. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the things I tell you I'm probably most proud of my whole career is being the mentor in teaching. I have 27 years of fellows and 10 years of junior partners that, that work solely under microscopes now to do their spine. So how do you teach it and replicate it? And then now, how do you replicate the model? So I started at Cedars, I, I did 10 years there and taught the fellowship and it was a hospital-based program. And I wanted to start a program with Cedars to build an outpatient center and transition it. When I started, you asked about you know, going in the hospital and expecting to have a long recovery for a spine surgery. When I started, the average length of stay was 6.8 days. When wow. I left 10 years later, it was 1.8 days. Now, the average length of stay for surgery is 12 hours. So it, it was the development of all the techniques of how to do this to get it done. And so you just, the, the, the old way of going about these surgeries was like just kind of crude and poorly thought out and you saw a way to, to refine the process or do the procedure more effectively or use these other disciplines I, I wasn't. I wouldn't say crude at all. It was a traditional in the way it was done, but it was a a larger open surgery where you had to open a big incision, and and uh, it it led to a lot of disability just the access to get to the spine. Uh, yeah. So what we changed was making things thought of in a minimally invasive approach: move less muscle, lose less blood, do it quicker, cleaner, but get the problem fixed. And then it just developed into all of the other pieces of the maintenance from figuring out that the health of the patient really mattered. Mm -hmm. If you have a overweight couch potato, it's very hard to fix their problem if they have the same physics creating the problem. Yeah. So we get into rehab and training and how to get the person move forward across the board with their lifestyle to stop creating the problem. And that's where the multidisciplinary came in. So I started thinking of it in a much bigger picture. And that was the evolution of what DISC is today. Uh, and, and now the, the final piece of that was moving it out of the hospital. Yeah, so I, I'm, I'm, this is fascinating. So you mentioned one thing, though, is just the improvements in the way you did the surgery in terms of making it more minimally invasive. That, that seems like something everyone would want to do, like cut less stuff, lose less blood. Why, was, why were you why were you the only one who pulled why, it why, off why was it taking so long yeah yeah so i, I got to work with zeiss at, uh, microscopes out of germany to actually develop the microscopes to do this with and develop the instruments and i hold the patents on a lot of the instruments that were designed to do it um the honest answer in the very early phases is it was difficult and didn't work very well gotcha. everything was tough and design the instruments was wrong and design the microscope was clunky and didn't focus right it, it's a the other part is it's a different world. And, and the best way I can explain this is you have to uncouple visual spatial from what your body is doing. A little complex topic. If you have to touch your nose and touch your finger, okay, you, you look at your finger and say it's a, a foot and a half away. I'm going to move my finger to, from my nose to my finger. Yeah. Put that under a microscope and, and move it up at four power. And now my, fing my nose to my finger is only a quarter of the way there. Now move it to 20 power. So you're staring into an optic and you're looking at a piece and what you see that would appear to be a foot and a half away to move your hand to get there, you're just twitching your fingers. It's a tiny motion. 
because yeah. I only have to move one twentieth of the distance. Yeah. Now put a variable piece of that scope, they have a foot pedal, to change that power constantly based on what you're looking at. And you just have to uncouple your brain from A to B is here to there. Huh. A to B is whatever it is as you move it under the scope. And it's a very different world. It, it was difficult to teach. Yeah. It required a fellowship. It requires thousands of hours of work under the scope. It's also something I found, honestly, that, that the newer generation uh, gets much better and learns much quicker than did the existing generation. Yeah, fair So I enough. had to keep working to keep up. But it, it was something that you couldn't take somebody in 10 or 12 years or 15 years into practice and say, here, turn around and use this. Yeah. They, they tried a few times and they couldn't do it or wouldn't work. That's too complicated. The instruments don't fit. It's, so it, it was a training issue. And um, that's where creating the fellowships and, and teaching and now uh, creating many years of fellows I've taught who've gone on and taught other years and it's taken over. But I, I don't think when I ventured into it, I realized it was going to be a 20-year a transition. I had the same question. Well, this works great. Why doesn't everybody use it? Mm -hmm. It's because I had the advantage of coming out and training with it from the start. Yeah. Yeah, and it sounds like from a timing standpoint, the technology was developing to be able to even do it, right? The, the technology was not there when it started. Yeah. I tell you, I, I've developed five generations of the scope with ice and a lot of the instruments we use and how they're used. So it, mm. it came uh, way back when, many years ago, 20-plus um, years ago, Gray's Anatomy came to me and said, um, what's the toughest case you've ever done? And, and uh, we, want, we want to make a, a film episode about it. So you can watch, uh, I think the episode was called Give Peace a Chance. Give peace a chance. So it's and they. I said, well, it was this tumor I took out. It took me twenty-seven hours to get it out. Oh my gosh! And um, they they actually stayed very true to the story in the episode. So you've got to watch it start to finish. But it was a a vascular tumor that was blood vessels wrapped throughout the almost half the spine through the chest in a physician uh, that was losing function. And everybody said, you know, you're going to die. It can't be taken out. There's no way. And um, uh, not to ruin the story, watch it and see, but he, he came to me and said, he, he worked with me for a while, then he came and said, take this out. Um, it took 27 hours standing under a microscope, glued to a scope with micro instruments. And this is before microscopes were really used to, to do these things. Yeah. And uh, he walked away. And he's wow. got uh, grown kids now, and he's, he uh, uh, was Chinese, he came out of Beijing, and he's actually an acupuncturist in, in LA and runs a giant practice. Wow, that's So he learned a lot, but it's, it wasn't there. The techniques weren't there. And it, yeah. it, um, they had to be developed, and then they had to be taught. So it was a big step. Yeah, so you're like part doctor, surgeon, part inventor a little bit, you know, with the microscopes and things. Like, that's obviously a whole different thing, right, developing these microscopes and getting the technology to fit the application. Well, it, w one of the parts I've always thought that you had to be stay ahead of the curve on was, you know, look at how it needed to be done, where it needed to go to, and then develop the field. So I, I got to develop the scopes, the instruments. I hold a pile of U.S. and international patents mm -hmm. on design of instruments and how they work. And it, it's been a fun and exciting time to help actually develop a field and create it and yeah. create the minimally invasive field. Yeah, so, so the first thing you said is, you, you know, going from this uh, surgery that's very invasive to making it more minimally invasive. And then the other thing is the, the bringing in the other disciplines and looking things in the, in the bigger picture. Uh, so you mentioned chiropractors and... A, a chiropractor, other. acupuncture, soft tissue, nutrition, rehab, um, trying to change the whole setup and life of the patient because usually people are getting in trouble for a reason. Uh, and, yeah. and, you know, I, I, and then I, I got into sports. That was the other sort of sideline okay. of, of doing this. And, and we learned a lot from taking care of the athletes. What uh, sports were you working with? Uh, what athletes? So, so many. I um, had, had, had a ton of fun in the career. I was, uh, had been the spine consultant with the Los Angeles Kings for, for many, many years. Okay. I played hockey in the first few years of college. So I got a natural in there. Uh, but I've been with the Kings, the Clippers, I'm still the consultant for the Raiders, uh, Team USA physician for several rounds of Olympics. And, and now the exciting one has been I'm um, responsible for all the Red Bull athletes, period, wow. everywhere. So if there's a big Red Bull athlete from you name it, I've, I've taken care of them from 
Ian Walsh, the big wave surfer, to Travis Rice for snowboarding, to Robbie Matson who jumps the motorcycles. They're, they're all my patients. We've put them all back together. But the exciting part of it was they taught us, hmm. and, and that was a huge piece. We learned from these people, A, their drive is unbelievable. It's just truly incredible, and they, they function at a different level. They're, they're that half of one percenters of the world that mm -hmm. can go do what they do in, in extreme sport. But they also didn't accept the, I'm going to be disabled or shut down. And so I had to create a whole new thinking in how we dealt with things to say, when you walk in the door, it wasn't me telling them how long they were going to be down. It was me asking, when's your next event? What, what do you have to do next? Where do we have to get you to yeah. to make you happy? Where, where, where's the... And we had to adapt what we did and how we did it to fit where they wanted to go, or I wouldn't still be the Red Bull doctor today. Yeah. So they, they nicknamed me Dr. Fix-It because <laughs> I, 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 kept, I kept putting them back and getting them going. And, um, yeah, like but it actually reshaped how we were looking at it. And then you take the things you learn from that and you try to start applying it to the general population of all the rest of us out there who aren't going to go jump a motorcycle off a building in Vegas. But... but you know, we have goals and we want to get things done in life. Um, it required a bigger picture than just me fixing A to B. Mm -hmm. And that's where, again, it's, uh, we, we learned from the sports. We learned from the military and the different pieces. And that's where the multidisciplinary concept came in. Really try to fix the whole problem. Yeah, so essentially you knew one way to do it, which was you get from A to B and it takes this long, but now all of a sudden you have to do it in less time. And so you need to roll in other things to make it happen at that rate essentially and so you're backing into the the process yeah they want to get from a to b yeah. in, in, in x and, and it's incredibly short it is not what you think of huh. so you know there can i be back in the gym in six days and can i be back out you know, working out in three weeks and can i be you know, i've got a competition in two and a half months and it, it gave an interesting challenge of of rethinking how we are doing it but the bottom line was the patients did better. Yeah. I'd seen that from the Air Force with the military pilots. Their, their drive was there. And I'd already had a taste of it and where it was going, and it fashioned some of it. But dealing with that high-end elite, it's not what we deal with from the day to day. I take care of the postman or, or anybody who walks in to come in. But dealing with that end of the elite really reformed how we started thinking about how can we be less invasive and how can we get a better outcome faster? And then take that out and apply it to everybody. So you have this idea that the future of medicine is going to be this multidisciplinary, minimally invasive outpatient model, for, for especially for the surgery that is normally high acuity, pr you know, procedures. What's the process of like the concept in your head to open the doors of a facility? So, so that was really well put. I could actually use that as a quote, the way you put it. So it's, it's good. Um, the next problem was the, the business of medicine okay. and, and how it was getting in the way. And um, that was a lot bigger problem than I thought it was going to be and, and, again, had to have an answer. And that's where, you know, you get back to the basic. Okay, be disruptive and, and figure out what's wrong and why it's not working. And, and it's a big problem. Uh, you know, medicine in the U.S. is, is really... Uh, uh, a huge debate always. Yeah. You go to the Affordable Care Act or go to, uh, the Affordable Care Act went through 168 pages and talked about the adequacy of medicine. Is that what you want? You want an adequate doctor to take care of you? Yeah. That, that, that's not okay. You, you, you want the top guy to take care of you. you want, I want great medicine. I don't want adequacy. Um, you know, and all the business molds came in and they weren't driven by the physicians. They were driven by different entities. But they weren't working, and and that's that's where this rethinking process came in. You take an HMO. Um, okay, let's create the business model. We're going to pay the doctor to not give care. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So you you may get X dollars and you take care of this many lives, and if you don't use up the dollars, you can keep the spare. So what are you going to do? Not give care. Yeah. Okay. You're going to going to get a ration it. Um, people don't want rationed care. They want they want their care given. You go to a, a the switch, the exact opposite of, of a, a fee for service model, and and you know it's a market driven system. 
I've learned all the business things afterwards. They didn't <laughs> teach in medical school, but it's market driven, and, and you don't want people charging excess fees or going over just because they're making a buck either. So that really wasn't working. And, and all the iterations in between came in. So the insurance companies stepped in, the major insurers, and said, we've got the answer. We'll just cut the rates. Okay, I'll, I'll get paid less. How many businesses do you know that in the last 10 years have taken over 100% reduction in what they got paid for doing the, the same, same product? Same stuff, yeah. Okay, same box. I, I, I make a widget, and this widget costs 3 bucks, and now i got to sell the same widget for a buck fifty, and then you got to sell it for a dollar, and where's the margin? It's just yeah. not there. So the insurers came in with the concept, we'll just cut the rates. Okay, if it's fee for service and you're cutting the rates, I'm going to do more. So we saw an escalation in the U.S. out of proportion to the rest of the world where people were putting in, I call it nuts and bolts, but rods and screws and implants and, and making surgeries bigger and bigger. Why? Because we need to get a fee for yeah, the service. Yeah, because if I was getting X, but now it's cut, i got to do more to get the same net. To, to, to even pay for my, my, my uh, expensive car lease or anything else. Yeah. I've got to go do more, and I've got to do bigger. and I've got So the, the market drivers didn't line up with what the capabilities of where we could go with minimally invasive and the market was just was crushing it the other way around so it, it wasn't the right answer and and you know likewise those things have failed and we don't have the right answers yet so people are looking at one payer system or they say well the u.s should be a socialized system socialized has failed in the world in my opinion every place has been put in place hmm. do, do you want to wait a year and a half to get your hip replaced when you can't walk, go to England. Do you want to not get this and, and, and care? Go to Canada. We have people come down here to get care. What does it create? It creates a two-class system. Mm -hmm. Those that can afford to get care pay cash for it. It exists in England. There's the monetary you, you buy yourself. And then the socialized system where you wait in a line to get care. That's not going to go over in the U.S. It's yeah. not going to work. It's not... We're driven these days to be uh, immediacy. We're the news business. You know, it, it's old news if it was an hour old. It used to be a paper you read the next day. It, it, we're, we're driven for immediate results and immediate gravi gratification. We're not going to put up with waiting six months or a year to get taken care of while you're disabled. It's not going to work. And, and you don't want to see it get pushed to a two-class system. Those can afford it, go buy it, and the ones don't. That's not right either. Yeah. So we're trying to create a new system that actually takes into account everybody's interests. And that's, that's what I call going back to the basis of where you do aligning incentives. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Who, who, who's in this game and who wants what? Yeah. So, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but the medical system seems like uh, one that tends to not to take kindly to people who want to buck the trend and, and create and change create something different and change things is that the the experience you've had in in trying to make improvements to it i i, I don't know any of the businesses ever are are necessarily kind to the the disruptor in the phase while they're disrupting they get looked back on and say man look how creative yeah, he was yeah, yeah. um I, I i actually enjoyed my spot and learned a huge amount from the teaching and cedars and everything else i got fired i, 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 <laughs> I, I got given 30 days notice and, and you're out because I was moving things to an outpatient center that wasn't there. It was, uh, you, you moved 10 or 12 million in business. What are, what are you doing? You're the yeah. chief of the program here. Uh, I, I got fired. Um, it led me to get going and create this, the first one in, in um, uh, L.A. 18 years ago, and now, the, now where I work full-time in, in Newport, which I opened uh, seven years ago, and do 100% of my practice there. Um, I don't think there's anyone else in the United States doing 100% of their practice at outpatient right now. So, yeah, I'm looked at as the... The person who's a bit ahead or out there. Um, there have been politics. You you got to look at uh, I call it who, who's ox or goring and and uh, you know who's gonna who's gonna go down if you and and there are people that push back against this and you know call it unsafe and call it all kinds of things and and that's where when if you're gonna do this and choose to be disruptive and and do things you have to be cautious that it's well thought out especially when you're dealing with people's lives. And it, it's well done. So we looked at every national benchmark from outcomes analysis. We looked at data. Data's king. We just kept mm -hmm. gathering data. Um, we looked at every national outcome from, from 
infections to to falls from heart attacks to blood clots to and we we set out to beat every national benchmark standard with our quality outcome and, and fortunately did so i'm in 7000 outpatient cases have never had a single infection wow there's not anybody in the country that can claim that in a hospital why we're different our environment's different our care is different our processes are different we're we're icing so it was it was taking a niche now is this where all medicine is going um no, not necessarily all of it, but, but there is going to be a big trend to taking large segments. I took spine care. It's applicable to a lot of other things, from cardiovascular to OB. It's applicable a lot of places, orthopedics. But I took it as a niche and built it up in this model to deliver high-acuity, site-of-service, outpatient, with a better outcome, and then collected the data and, and that's really what enabled me one day to get the insurers to say, okay, I've got the data to show you this is more cost efficient. I can move the basis points of the cost of doing it and not 1% or 2%. I can move them down 30 or 40% hmm. for the cost of the event. I can get a better outcome. Here's the documented data, benchmark it against every national piece. It's better and I can make the patient happier. My patient satisfaction scores run 99 plus percent. The best I was ever able to run in hospitals, 60, 70, 80 percent at the very best. Hmm. So we moved up quality, we moved cost efficient, and we're keeping the patients happy. Now we've aligned everybody's incentives. Yeah. We have a win-win. And and this is all basically by improving the model with the multiple disciplines. Like you're able to do all that because of the multi multidisciplinary. Putting everybody together, thinking about it all, and pushing and teaching the microscope approach. It, mm -hmm. it was a culmination of all that. So now the last phase is, how do you put that all into a business? Yeah, so, that, so my question, so now you're talking about operations, and you're a surgeon, and you have to manage this team of people how did how did that go? I mean, you mentioned it's been a, it's been twenty years, but I mean, how is it with getting these other practitioners and specialists to to roll into and integrate into your multidisciplinary model? So what it what it took was getting enough people out there trained over enough period of time, and, and some very other very creative other people in the U.S. started doing this too, Texas Back Institute, uh, some big places, and and between us, we've trained many, many, many years of fellows. And many of those have gone out now and set up models like we have at DISC and setting them up. So when I lectured about this uh, 15 years ago at a, a thing called Becker's, which is the, the business of doing medicine, uh, I got looked at crosswise and, and they just said, what, you, you can't do that, that doesn't exist. It's not even on the register. Well, 15 years later, it's 15% of the way spine is done in the US now and a lot of the national predictors have it predicted to be at up to 50% in the next four or five years. Hmm. Now you're talking about a $10 billion plus industry with a shift that quickly, you're talking about a major disruption in how things are done. And that's not even with all the spin-off business that happens. So it, it's a major shift in where things are going. So I'm now trying to set up the model that's gonna manage that shift. Hmm. So. So the other disciplines, like you've mentioned some things like nutrition and, you know, what, what, are, what are a handful of the disciplines that you roll into the service at DISC? Well, you have to, you, again, you have to look at the entire package of what's happening to the patient. So whether we roll in the services directly through us or we network with surrounding gotcha. people to do it, um, we, we try to get an approach to the patient that is going to be We'll fix your problem, and we'll get you back on the right path. Yeah, and, and that right path involves, you know, nutrition, exercise, uh, proper look at alternative care in the opioid crisis, getting rid of the opioids, and getting down to, to acupuncture or soft tissue or chiropractic or things to manage the soft tissue things. Uh, it, it's really trying to look at a comprehensive picture. A lot of it we do by networking and, and involving people that have their specialty and their pieces, but networking it all and becoming the captain of the ship where it's going and, and, and get the patient on board with doing this. Yeah. So it, it, it's getting everybody together. We don't try to do it all right there. Gotcha. Um, it's, it's, um, 
for creating the, the mindset and the program for the patient. So you take the patient's needs, which obviously vary probably pretty drastically from person to person. You figure out what the desired outcome is and you back into, well, here's what we can do and the things that we can't do. You network with other people. So you create this. Essentially, any discipline can play a role in this patient care depending on how you fold it in with other yeah. people. Any discipline can and, and they need to. Yeah. To, to get that complete patient because a surgeon alone is not going to be the total answer. So we, we need to get the whole piece in there and set going. Um, and, and, and then the, the, the final piece of this was creating the new concept, which I call Trius. Okay. So that, that's the, new, the next step. What's that? Can you tell us? Or is this yeah. like the no. top secret? Okay. No, it's, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I can tell you, but then I'm going to kill you. No, nah, no. Nah. That was back in the military days, <laughs> doing intelligence work. So the um, uh, tr Trius is, is now th that next step. Okay, we've got the training in place. We've trained a lot of years of people, and they're all starting up. How do we get everybody else on board? So that was the step of taking all the data and, and showing the world, especially the insurers, that we could do it differently. And um, so we created a new model. And, and the new model, instead of an HMO or a PPO or this or that, is is something different. So if you walk in the door of, of DISC right now and you have an insurance card, I started with two companies. I started with Blue Shield and with United um, because they're between the two of them, they're over 50% of the population in Southern California. So we started a model that's um, it's called Global Pay. So if you walk in the door to have a procedure done with us or anything done, you give us your insurance card, you other than whatever you owed your copay or your deductible that you signed up for in your policy, you never get a bill from us. Surgeon, assistant, anesthesia, center, neuromonitoring, work, nothing. We say, thank you for your insurance. And, and you look and go, wait a minute, I, I got my hernia done at the hospital. I had bills coming in the door for the next two years. Wait a minute. Everybody, are they in a provider? Are they not a provider? Are they this? I work with the insurer to create a product that's the episode of the care and we package it and I settle with the insurer for one bill for one price. It eliminates all the problems with the insurer on packaging that. We don't have to code it and this and that. I do a type one or a type two. Wow. A, a minimally invasive this, a, a moderately. And I get a check and I settle with everybody. So the patient isn't in the billing cycle anymore. Wow. The patient gets access to a top quality place with a 99% patient satisfaction and gets the quality of what they want. It's applicable across the board to everybody, not just the elite athletes. It's everybody out there with an insurance program of any type. It covers every Blue Shield product down through whatever it is, any, any, any of the coverages. And for the insurer, they get what they want. They get, they call it risk mitigation. They get the ability across a large network to show an outcome for a price. Mm -hmm. So they can calculate out and get into their actuarial things they do to try to figure out what they're getting. So they can sell a better product. So I've got the insurer, the patient, and, and the billing thing taken care of. And the last thing was to take care of the doctor. And what we've been able to do is go out and with the muscle of setting this up, negotiate with the insurer to say, wait a minute, I need to pay my doctors a little better hmm. so they can choose to do things less invasive and involve all these alternative treatments and make sure they send somebody out for a block of nutrition that may keep them from operating. Hmm. And, but when they do do things, they need to be reasonably paid. So I've been able to get the insurers to give a better contract to the doctors or actually pay them a bit more. And because the minimally invasive model is already so much cheaper anyways, you have a little bit of, of leverage there? The combination of that microscope approach in the outpatient center gave me such a large margin and getting that down and improving the quality. If you get one infection, it costs the insurers hundreds of thousands of dollars for ongoing drugs and pain management. So just having no infections that period of time saved them untold, literally billions wow. in pictures. So yes, there was enough savings in quality to create a situation that now I can have the insurers helping drive this development, which originally, when I first started, I, I couldn't get a contract with any insurer. They just said, oh, can't be done. We're mm -hmm. with the hospital. Uh, DISC has had 300% growth in the last year. Oh, my gosh. It, it's crazy. almost hard to keep up with it. 
on, on a development pathway. Uh, six surgeons now at that location doing the procedures and, and growing up. So we're on a curve that's almost off the map. Hmm. And now it's going to be how to manage that. But the driving effort now is this, uh, this model, TRIAS. So the next step that now is the starting step is we're ready to go. We've got the authorization from insurers. We're going to go out and multiply. Hmm. And how do you do that? You take people we trained in centers that know how to do this way of doing things and thinking and you give them a model in the business world that works for their center and allows them that growth and you get the insurers to push. The final step of that, back to the who's ox do you go? Um, you know, the hospitals are going to see this massive migration of what was paying well for them into an outpatient world. I, I think ultimately this belongs in health systems where a system instead of just a hospital, hmm. it's a system. And, and just like they have internists or or outpatient centers, they start thinking on a system-wide approach. And they start thinking of how can we do this on a, on a broad basis. And I, I think you'll see these centers will merge back into systems in the big picture. Hmm. And that's where I see it going. Wow. Dr. Bray, uh, doctor, neurosurgeon, innovator. Very cool. Uh, it's interesting to, it's a, like kind of a history lesson for me as well as uh, an idea, uh, uh, lesson about the medical industry and and business, so very cool. As we transition, uh, one thing, obviously not a lot of people in business are in the business of medicine, but what's something you've learned through your career that you think is a principle that translates across industry? Um, the, the, the principle has been in really, in really finding um, what you wanna do, where you wanna go. Uh, I like to quote Gretzky, uh, Newman took care of him for years. They skate where the puck is going. Um, you know, <laughs> That's get, a good quote. Get, get the concept of, of where you want to take it, why, make sure it's sound and what you do, and, and then stick with it to get it there. And, and it's not necessarily going to be an easy pathway. And you run into hurdles you find along the way, whether those are politics or disruptive or recreating or time phases. I thought I'd have this done in four or five years. And my 30th year of practice and I'm just getting it organized now um, you, you run into pieces but you you stick with it and you 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 do it to get it done and and then you try to figure out how to balance out with life and just keep life going and 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 the people around you you work with and show them they want to have a focus on their life what I've learned over the years is you know you can't buy your own health you, you got to pay attention to it and you got to you gotta, you gotta nurture it and you gotta work on it. And, and that requires getting back to what some people think of basic principles, but you know, taking the time off, resting, getting your head involved in other things, exercising, getting your nutrition in line. I mean, th they seem like basic things. You think, oh, everybody knows. Everybody doesn't know about those things. So it, it's that balance and that's, so you can get where you wanna go, balance so you can put the energy you get there. Switching to the muzzle load round now. What have you accomplished in your business that you're most proud of? I think if you look at what I'm most proud of, it would be creating something that was replicable. Hmm. It wasn't just a one-off. Getting the idea, setting up the whole concept, and then figuring out how to teach it and how to replicate it. And that's been the complex part of what we developed over time. The teaching was not a small, small task to get people to work under a microscope. The implementation wasn't small, getting it into these centers, building the whole center when it had never been built before to do it. Um, focusing on all the pieces, but getting it so it was replicatable, so it could actually become something that changed the way we're doing it. It wasn't just one person doing it differently. It was creating that environment to allow that change to happen. And that's, that's really what I'm proud of, that now it, it is a national trend. It's, it, it went from zero to... 15%, it'll be at 40 or 50%. It's unstoppable at this point. So now I'm kind of on the ride trying to be involved in how I can help form it and control it, not be the Wild West and keep some, some principles behind it. Hmm. If you could go back in time, what would you tell a younger version of yourself? Uh, so um, I, I think I'd tell them, don't let it consume you. And, um, you know, pay attention to where you're going and put all your energy into it, but, but find the right balance. I, I lost some things in the way by that, 
that uh, if you ask my kids that same question, they, they tell you dad wasn't there a lot of times when he should have been or, or needed to be. And I'm, I'm working hard to rebuild those things now in my life. Um, you, you, can't, you can't lose focus of yourself and your life and your family and, and, and whatever the important things are to you to, to on a personal outside of your business um, because you don't do as well in business when you're not balanced. And, and the people that have come and done well over the years in whatever field they're in, they, they managed to find that somehow. Uh, I lost track of it for a while and, and had to refind it. Um, but that's, that's the important part. What are you reading, listening to, or subscribed to currently for personal and or professional development? Big, big question. Um, the, the world has changed, obviously, and uh, the Internet is, uh, has changed many things about many businesses and many pieces. And for us, what it really did was make information accessibility I- incredibly different. So where I used to have to go and sit in a library and look things up, I can have on my, my smartphone in seconds. Um, a lot of what I do for the medical to keep up, I mean, I've written or presented almost 300 papers or presentations or things over the years. So we, we do a lot in, in, in writing for things, but it's, it's now everything is accessible. You have to be careful the personal touch is not lost. You have to be careful the personal touch isn't lost. You still need to go to meetings and interface with people, but most of the stuff's available digitally now. So we, it's not one thing anymore. If I want to go look up a topic of what everybody else is doing, I can hit PubMed and, and see, I don't have one article. I can go across the entire literature and, and do it. So it's more than an individual topic now. The, the information is so accessible. It's a matter of filtering it and getting it through. Yeah, there's definitely information overload at times. Uh, what habits, routines you have to stay on top of your game? I, I think that gets back to now. I'm I'm trying to learn to, still trying to learn, uh, is to to fit in what I can do to stay on top of things. I have to keep myself fit, alert, you know, engaged. When I go there, I want to be there because I've done something else. I I, I race sailboats. I got into that because my my wife's a three-time national champion. And it was either that or be a, a, a sailing widow. I'd go off to see her off do regattas. So I, I um, you know, I, I learned to sail, and, and we sail at a, at, a, at a very high level as amateurs. Um, you know, it, whatever it is you do, I like water sports. We love skiing. We, we get in, take time off. Um, I spend a lot of time with my kids. And, you know, I've got a pile of kids and grandkids, and and try to spend a lot of time with them, uh, doing what they love, and and it's passions. So to me, it's all about finding passions. Uh, I'm passionate about what I do in the operating room and what I'm doing with the business. The biggest part for me is balancing that and getting it out the other way. And not getting kind of younger. I'm 64 last week. And, and uh, it's extra work to stay fit and, and work hard and, and be able to do the things you want to do. Uh, the boat I sail is designed for 20 and 30-year-olds. Uh, <laughs> I've got to stay competitive in it. So it's... it's uh, it's finding that balance and that, that ability to focus on your personal health and fitness, multidisciplinary, which is the same thing I'm saying in the real world, out there trying to deliver. It's finding all that. But that keeps you sharp in the, in the business, and it keeps you engaged, and it keeps you ready to put the energy into that passion. Thanks so much for your time today. Thanks for sharing about your story and all the interesting stuff about your industry. It's fascinating. Uh, what's your website? Where can people go to find more? Uh, you, you can just Google DISC, D-I-S-C, and, and, or my name, and we come up anywhere. But um, it's discmdgroup.com, which is a little complicated. But the, if you just Google DISC, you find us and, and hear the story. And we've really uh, engaged that with trying to tell the story of our patients rather mm-hmm. than just all about us. So you'll find patient videos and, and their stories and how it's changed their lives and how focus has been. So... Uh, we're trying to keep it right back down, even in our marketing and development and web development, which is all new to me. Mm-hmm. And when, I, when I when I first got out, uh, way 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 back when, they put up a sign, a billboard, and everybody looked at me and said, "You can't do marketing in medicine." <laughs> and uh, you know, uh, times have changed. So now we have a website that that gets half a billion exposures. Um, it's it's about the patients, and it should stay about the patients. So if you look up DISC and any of the patient stories, that's what you'll see. 
Dr. Robert Bray, thank you again so much. This has been fantastic. Well, thank you for having me, and uh, it's a real opportunity, real honor to be here and get the opportunity to tell the story.